Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. I'll, I'll start out with Antelope 25-7. <clears throat> so we don't have any significant changes planned for the pronghorn regulations this year, and we won't have permit recommendations until after the production or the uh, winter counts are conducted in about January. Um, I thought I might provide just a quick overview of the program for the uh, new and newer commissioners, I guess. Um, so hunting occurs in, pronghorn hunting occurs in western Kansas, and if you uh, turn the page there to the second page, you can see the, the units that are open. Um, the unit boundaries are the same as the deer units, but in reality, most of the pronghorn are found in the western uh, one to two tiers of counties. Uh, you could say three, I guess, uh, and count Gove in that as well, but most of the hunting is in uh, the far western part of the state. Probably the most important component of pronghorn hunting in Kansas is that uh, the de demand for pronghorn permits far exceeds the, the availability or the, the population of pronghorn. So you have uh, muzzleloader hunters applying two to four years and firearm hunters applying six to eight years or more before they draw a permit. Um, and the firearm and muzzleloader permits are allocated through a true preference point system where the individual with the most preference points draws the permit, which is a little different than what we have for elk. Um, archery permits are unlimited, and I guess the main thing about the archery permits in recent years is that, incre is that uh, interest has substantially increased. We went from an average harvest of 18 animals from between the years of 2000 and 2009 up to 57 animals the last two seasons. So, uh, and during this time, permit uh, archery permits increase from 150 up to about 300 on average. So uh, this is just a, a little something we're watching. Um, it's also worth noting recently here that the drought in western Kansas has not been favorable for pronghorn. Uh, two summers ago the drought was severe in the south in unit 18, it was moderate in unit 17, and then it was uh, conditions were actually good in unit 2. But this past year uh, conditions were very poor in all three units and we uh, during our production surveys in July and August um, we had fawn to doe ratios of only 19 fawns per hundred does we would hope to see 60 70 even 80s during really good years so it was extremely low and in fact the 19 per hundred ratio was the lowest we had recorded since the first year uh, that the surveys were conducted, and that was in 1963 when pronghorn were still um, becoming established or reestablished in western Kansas. Uh, so uh, as a result of that, it's reasonable to speculate that permit allocations will be on the downward trend. Now those fawns that were born this year, uh, most of the harvest is bucks that are over at least a year and a half old, so those fawns don't impact this year's harvest because they're not typically shooting fawns anyway, but next year when those animals would be yearlings, and especially the year after that when they would be at least two and a half years old, a lot of hunters would be willing to have taken those animals, and so uh, permit adjustments will probably be made because of the drought in the future, which will further exacerbate the issue with demand versus resource availability. So um, anyway, I guess that's kind of a, a summary of the program. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Yeah, Matt, the, the drought, does, does, does it affect uh, the ability to provide milk for the fawn, or does it have a conception rate being in poor condition going into the rut in the fall, or both? Well, I don't think we have very good data on that, but... Um, it probably has more to do with predation than anything else. I mean, predation can increase as a result of poor um, condition of the doe. So, I mean, I don't. That's a tough question to answer, and I can't tell you exactly what role the health of the doe has in the predation of the fawn. It can also be an issue with cover and the ability of the predator, the coyotes primarily well, to find in other states that have drought I mean it, it's a uh, drought has that effect on antelope and I just didn't know whether it was this year's drought affects next year's fawn crop or whether next year's drought affects next year's fawn crop 
That doesn't make any difference. Yeah. yeah. Well, in in this case, it's it's this year's. I mean, this year's drought affects this year's fawn crop. When the drought occurs uh, early, like it did this year, um, it affects this year's crop. Any other questions from the commission? From the public, Michael. Matt, what'd you find in the Flint Hills this year? Uh, I don't think I brought the exact number, but it's still in the neighborhood of 30 is what, I mean, I think we actually saw a few less than that. Production wasn't particularly good there either. Well, we were over 50 that one year. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. And that was, that was going to be my question. What, what was the high there? That one year it was 50 or 54, I think, is what we counted maybe. I think it was 54, 56 the year that I went with you. But that's been several years, and, and we have not counted near that many since then. I don't know. It's still a little bit of a mystery to me why we had that one year blip because we've never been over 30 since then. How many, how many were released total? Over like 200 or something? Yeah, a couple hundred. Any other questions from anybody? Thank you. Okay. Moving on to elk then. Uh, KAR 11525-8. Again, we've kind of hit equilibrium with this regulation. After about my first 10 years in this position, we had changes every year, but uh, we finally um, come up with something I think we can live with, and uh, complaints have been minimal. So. Um, for the newer commissioners, I'll provide you a little bit of a little bit of an overview. Uh, most of the elk hunting opportunity in the state occurs on Fort Riley military installation. And uh, when people talk about elk hunting in Kansas, this is primarily what they're talking about. We have about a thousand applications a year for uh, these permits, and about half of these permits are allocated to military personnel. So in reality, you have, uh, for the most part, less than a 1% chance of drawing um, an antlered elk permit on Fort Riley. We do have elk on private lands in the state, but they're mostly, um, for the most part, they're pretty darn unpredictable. And in a place or two where they are predictable, they're fairly uh, difficult to obtain access to. So the, the hunting opportunity um, off of Fort Riley is really limited for members of the general public. Uh, we have three elk units, and again, if you look to the back page of the uh, regulation there, unit one is closed to elk hunting, and this is the area that, in, that um, encompasses uh, Cimarron National Grasslands. Um, elk were reintroduced there, and hunting season, and hunting took place there until 1995, and since that time, there really haven't been huntable populations in Kansas consistently enough um, to reopen a season there, and that herd is relatively small, probably around 50 animals, and it spends most of its time in Colorado and Oklahoma. Unit 2 is the area surrounding, including and surrounding Fort Riley. Um, <clears throat> and then Unit 3, the remainder of the state, <clears throat> is the remainder of the state. So the season on Fort Riley is from September 1 through December 31, and uh, the September season is muzzleloader and archery only, but the remainder of that season is open to uh, all weapon types. It could be firearm, archery, or, or muzzleloader, and the purpose of this is to accommodate um, potential restrictions that take place on the fort where they may not allow, say, firearms in a given area, but they would allow archery or muzzleloader, so uh, that's done a little bit different than the remainder of the state, which the equipment restrictions there are generally um, similar to or the same as uh, deer, restrictions with deer, and this is done for consistency and simplicity. Um, in Unit 2, the permits off of Fort Riley are limited to hunt owned land permits, and then in Unit 3, so uh, if a landowner just outside of Fort Riley has elk coming off of Fort Riley onto his property, he can get a hunt owned land permit. In Unit 3, the remainder of the state, we have unlimited permits. Um, that can be purchased by general residents or landowner tenants. They're available over the counter. And the purpose of this, of the liberal nature of this area, is to allow for elk that may be causing damage um, to, or other conflicts on private lands to be harvested and for landowners to have the opportunity to control um, elk or maintain elk at suitable numbers. 
And like I said at the beginning, this is a system that has worked well for us. We haven't had really com uh, very many complaints. We've had a few around Fort Riley, and we've worked to um, resolve those issues. But on uh, elsewhere on private lands, uh, we haven't. I don't think we've had any complaints since we've implemented this system. So with that, I would take any questions. How many applicants do you get a year for the, the Fort Riley? Over a thousand, yeah. including military on and non-military. There's usually over 900 general residents applying. And how many tags, general residents? Um, it's variable, but 25 has been. There's typically been 10 or 12 any elk permits and about 15 antlerless elk permits total that would be valid on Fort Riley. When you apply, do, can you apply for a bull tag only? Yes. Okay. It's like the other, like deer or anything else that you have a first choice and a second choice, but if you only put a first choice, for example, <laughs> then that's the only thing you could draw. And there's no <clears throat> point system there, it's just a draw. Um, we actually implemented a bonus point system a few years ago where if you've applied for five years, you get five chances in the draw. It's different than the true preference point system because with that many people applying, you the only people who would ever draw would be those who applied the first year if it was a true preference point system. But with this one, a first year applicant might still draw a permit over a guy who's been applying for 10 years, but the guy who's been applying for 10 years has a 10 times better chance. Now those tags that we what are they called? The, the governor's tags? Is that right? Commissioner's permit. Or commissioner's permit, I guess. Uh, are those included in these tags? Uh, the, one of those is issued in addition to these. Okay. So, if, yeah, if we issued 10 any elk tags, then there would actually be 11 any elk hunters out there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Matt, are there any elk harvested in Unit 3 in, in a year's time? Uh, yes, we've had one bull elk harvested this year, um, and oh, I don't have it off the top of my head, but there was probably four or five elk harvested in Unit 3 last year, and okay. we sold qu uh, quite a few permits, like uh, 40, 40 to 50 permits uh, in Unit 3. Last all year. in a pretty tight circle around. No, Colorado. they're they're scattered around all over the place. There's a, like I said, the elk are out there unpredictably, but when they show up, a lot of times we might sell a permit or two for people that are hunting them. the The herd I've mentioned in the past is is uh, in Hamilton County, but there's also elk in uh, Ford County and in Reno in the Reno County area that have been there for several years, and probably still some in Saline County. We've consistently um, observed and documented and even have a, had a few road kills in some of those counties. Okay. Not very many, but I think we've had one or two in Saline County, but. Is there any, are there any other questions for Matt? <clears throat> Michael? Well, success rate's been the last few years on the, the unit two. Uh, Seven out of 13 of the any elk permits harvested last year, including two that were filled by antlerless elk, and then um, five of the 15 um, antlerless elk permits were filled, the Fort Riley permits. So, and that's been fairly, we've had any, we've had, that was down some, because typically we'd been in the neighborhood of 50% on the antlerless permits, and of course the any elk permits Oh, until the last, we've had a few downward years the last few years, but prior to that, I mean, I'm looking at records here. In 2008, 11 of 11 filled tags. So, I mean, we for the most part, those permits, even though it's a hard hunt, we've had a high success rate in the past, but it has dropped off a, a, a year or two here. It's a little bit lower. Can the landowners around Fort Riley, their hunt your own land permit, can they shoot a bull or a cow on that? They, they can now if they buy the, they can, the any elk permit is available to them just like it's available to the landowners off of Fort Riley. And we have had a few, um, a few of those killed, you know, a few bulls killed by landowners off of Fort Riley. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions for Matt? All right, thank, thank you. you. Eve? Hey, Mr. Chairman, I'm, uh, nobody had a fire 
PowerPoint this time around, so I decided I'd do one. So, well, good. I'm going to ask you all to take the front row and crank up the PowerPoint. Might be the easiest way for me to kind of explain what's going on with Lesser Prairie Chicken. There we go. Um, well, the commission is certainly aware of the fact that uh, the lesser prairie chicken has been uh, looked at for a listing by the Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, I kind of feel like I'm talking to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, well, there we go. We got a little extra cord here. <laughs> that's not. That's a little better. Um, and so. Um, we're in the process right now of developing a range-wide uh, conservation plan for the lesser prairie chickens. And when we talk about uh, range-wide, we're talking about five states of Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Texas. And uh, this particular slide introduces uh, you to John Hoffler, who's with this Ecosystem Management Research Institute. And uh, John has been uh, contracted by the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, to assist us in uh, in preparing this plan. Now, the the slide series that I uh, PowerPoint that I have here um, is a set of a pieces of information that we put together to uh, present to some of our uh, stakeholders. And uh, thus far, uh, we've uh, met with um, the uh, Kansas uh, representative from the Kansas Independent Oil and Gas Association. Uh, Farm Bureau, uh, KLA, uh, West Star, and um, some members of the uh, governor's uh, staff, uh, just to introduce them to this uh, that this process. And so, uh, I want to use the same slide series essentially to give you kind of the same thumbnail sketch of um, of what's. Uh, what's going to be taking place. I also have to sort of give uh, credit, not sort of, we give a lot of credit to Jim Pittman, uh, who uh, represents Kansas um, in this effort and has put a lot of effort in it and is continuing to do a lot of work as it relates to this uh, planning uh, process. So anyway, we all know that uh, what's sort of brought this thing on is there's been significant declines in, uh, popu in the population of lesser prairie chickens, as well as the extent uh, of their range uh, uh, throughout the five states. Uh, back in 1996, uh, this uh, particular species uh, was uh, uh, um, uh, uh, named by the Fish and Wildlife Services as warranted but precluded from listing. And warranted but precluded simply means that uh, if, uh, if they didn't have a lot of other species uh, to work with in terms of the Endangered Species Act, they would have uh, sort of run this thing to the top of the list. So back in 1996, uh, we, we did do some work in terms of preparing information uh, that essentially uh, put it into this category. And it was there uh, until just recently. And it was actually at a level eight in their uh, sort of their uh, listing pr um, priority list. And then it jumped to a number two. Um, the initial listing decision, uh, which would be their proposed listing, as they call it, was supposed to come out. Uh, on September 30th of this year. Um, <clears throat> we were expecting that announcement, uh, but the word that we got was that uh, Fish and Wildlife Service applied for a 60-day extension uh, on that uh, final 
uh, announcement of the proposed listing. And so now we would expect that to come uh, sometime in uh, probably late, mid to late November. And it was primarily asked for because of additional information uh, that they wanted to take a, take a look at. Okay, when we talk about uh, the range itself, uh, this is simply a map that uh, depicts what would have been the, uh, the historic range, uh, the lesser chicken, and, uh, and then the range that uh, we currently recognize uh, uh, for that bird uh, throughout the uh, five states. And you can see that uh, uh, a fair amount of that uh, does occur uh, in the southwestern part of the state. Okay, there are essentially three uh, impacts that, uh, three categorized, categories of impacts that uh, we've identified that uh, uh, need to be addressed in the plan and certainly have had their, uh, have had their influence on the current status of the bird in terms of range uh, and population numbers. And of course those uh, include everything from uh, uh, conversion of, of prairies into cropland, uh, certainly some of the oil and gas exploration that takes place, uh, wind energy and the development of new wind farms, uh, transmission, and uh, other sorts of industries that are taking place on the land that uh, kind of have a, that, that do have a direct uh, impact uh, on com uh, conversion of the habitat. There's also indirect conversion uh, of habitat, and this is something that we've seen particularly in the Red Hills uh, of, of Kansas, and uh, that is changes in grazing regimes and uh, use of fire. Uh, and of course, the result of that has been uh, tremendous encroachment of uh, eastern red cedar uh, in Kansas. And uh, trees uh, and uh, woody vegetation uh, is not, uh, does not make for uh, the best of uh, lesser prairie chicken uh, habitat. And of course in some areas uh, invasive species of grasses and, and plants have been a, uh, a, a source of, uh, of concern as well. Uh, cool season grasses, brome, fescue, uh, those kinds of uh, plants as well as when you went south in the southern part of the uh, range, particularly in Oklahoma, and, uh, where uh, during the CRP days, uh, old world blue stems, some exotic grasses were used uh, in their CRP uh, plantings. I have to say that uh, Kansas and, and our folks that were working on CRP planting uh, recommendations uh, during the uh, uh, during the time when these decisions were made uh, were very, very instrumental in the fact that Kansas uh, used uh, native grasses uh, for those plantings and then later incorporated even uh, native forbs uh, into those uh, uh, CRP plantings as well. And so we can, uh, uh, amongst maybe some other things, we can certainly uh, um, give a lot of credit uh, to those folks who uh, got this kind of thing into our CRP program and of course the amount of CRP program that we have in the state uh, that has really uh, sort of uh, bolstered uh, populations of lesser prairie chickens in Kansas compared to, uh, to our uh, neighboring states. Okay, so the purpose of the plan, of course, uh, is to address this whole listing issue, and, uh, and we do have to have a plan uh, presented to the Fish and Wildlife Service by the end of March for their consideration uh, as they go forward towards final listing. Um, they essentially have uh, one year uh, from the time in which they um, make their proposed listing, although even though this is going to probably come the end of November, uh, the clock really started on September 30th. So uh, we're under the gun uh, and would expect that there would be a, a um, final uh, determination uh, at the end of September in uh, 2013. So the plan essentially uh, is aimed at protecting, enhancing, and restoring uh, lesser prairie chicken habitats and then also addressing some of the factors that are leading to uh, these declines. Uh, and namely in the case of some of the industry out there and working with industry and placement of, uh, of much of what's going on on the land and uh, to, um, 
uh, impact uh, or to uh, minimize or avoid uh, those impacts. Identifying research needs. Uh, as you go into a listing process, uh, the more information that you know about these birds and the management of these birds, the better off uh, we're going to be. So uh, the plan will uh, address uh, research needs. <clears throat> of course, uh, identifying management actions. Uh, to support responsible uh, development. And that sort of goes back to what I just said in terms of uh, wind farm placement, uh, oil and gas exploration, uh, transmission line placement, those kinds of things can have a tremendous impact. And uh, so part of the plan will be to uh, address those uh, kind of management actions. And uh, on the landowner, the private landowner side of things, uh, essentially develop incentives uh, to the landowners uh, for improving or restoring uh, suitable habitat. Populations uh, and habitat goals uh, needed to be set, and so a science team uh, was established uh, to take a look at what these uh, population goals and habitat goals should be. And uh, the first thing on the list there uh, are the participants of this five-state uh, interstate working group. And then a, a host of other uh, experts and uh, knowledgeable folks uh, relative to lesser prairie chickens. So we have university people's, uh, people, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service folks, uh, NRCS, uh, joint venture. Uh, but these people all have uh, a great deal of knowledge relative to uh, what's needed uh, in developing these uh, population goals and habitat goals. So. Uh, out of this group and uh, uh, came a goal uh, for the lesser prairie chicken for the five state range wide area uh, of 66,000 birds. <clears throat> now I'm going to interject here and say that this last spring uh, the five states uh, did uh, cooperate in doing a range wide aerial survey, a helicopter survey of lesser prairie chickens. And it was a statistically uh, designed and uh, statistically reliable estimates that came from that or estimates that came in terms of uh, statistical uh, uh, sampling uh, procedures. And uh, that those counts came in at uh, 37,000 uh, plus a few extra birds. So around 37,000 birds uh, is the estimated population based on that uh, range-wide uh, aerial survey. Um, now, the other point that I'd make is that uh, while we didn't actually uh, break this out uh, by state, um, uh, Jim uh, tells me that we probably uh, have around two-thirds of that number are, uh, are located in Kansas, and that's, that's just kind of, a, um, I think, an a estimate on his part or a guesstimate on his part based on what he's seen in the data. So at any rate, the point is that Kansas uh, really does uh, support uh, the host of uh, the lesser prairie chickens that we have uh, today. Now, um, this uh, also part of the population goal structure was to break this into the four ecoregions uh, that are found in the range. Uh, Shinnery Oak, of course, uh, primarily in uh, New Mexico and Texas, uh, sand sagebrush, uh, mixed grass, and short grass. And uh, the, uh, 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 practically all of the short grass uh, ecosystem our eco region is uh, is found in Kansas. A fair amount of the mixed grass and some of the sand uh, sagebrush is uh, in Kansas. So, again, a fair amount of this uh, of these eco regions are found uh, uh, in our state. So, in order to address then these goals and uh, in to hone in on the on the landscape, uh, it was decided that uh, we needed to use uh, kind of a focal area concept. And uh, these focal areas are essentially areas that are designated where conservation efforts will be concentrated. And um, instead of using what uh, at least John calls here in this, uh, in this slide uh, series is the random acts of kindness, uh, we really kind of concentrate and uh, focus on these uh, specific areas as we develop the programs. The random acts of kindness are just a lot of uh, various places where people are doing good things, but in the end don't really add up uh, to the kinds of impacts that need to, we need to make on the large blocks of habitat that are necessary for uh, 
uh, supporting these birds. So uh, the focal area characteristics, uh, again, coming out of the science group, was that uh, the focal area should average about 50,000 acres in size, and about 70% of each of those areas should be in good to high quality habitat. And uh, the next criteria being that a minimum of 25,000 uh, to be in good to high quality, uh, with a minimum being of 25,000 being in the good to high quality habitat. Focal area should be within 20 miles of another focal area and uh, that they should have linkage zones. So again, uh, we don't want the areas to be uh, fragmented in such a way uh, that uh, you don't have connection uh, between these uh, important uh, uh, habitat areas that are, uh, that are uh, identified. The habitat goals then, uh, if we use uh, five birds per square mile, and assuming that 75% of the population is going to be in that focal area, then the habitat uh, goal for an overall population of 66,000 birds it would be 6.3 million acres uh, held within these focal areas. Now that's on a, uh, a range-wide basis. So uh, essentially this equates to approximately 126 of these focal areas if, uh, if they're uh, in that 50,000 acre um, size range. The Kansas goal uh, pulled out of that would be approximately 4.5 million acres that would be included in, uh, in our important focal areas. Now the selection of those focal areas, uh, and we'll get to a map here that uh, Jim and others were instrumental in putting together for Kansas. But the selection of these focal areas included uh, our existing population distributions, uh, areas where we have best remaining habitat, uh, areas with the best habitat potential, uh, proximity to any wildlife management areas or similar uh, protected public areas, and then where possible, uh, avoiding high priority development areas. And so when I get to the map, I'll show you what this really means uh, in terms of uh, avoiding uh, some of these development areas. So in this particular map, uh, we've got uh, the yellow uh, outline as the sand sage focal areas within Kansas. Uh, the blue, uh, mostly in the Red Hills area and, and north, is the mixed grass focal area. And then you can see the massive uh, amount of short grass uh, focal area. And you can see there the acres uh, that, uh, that Jim and others have uh, calculated uh, for these uh, important focal areas for Kansas. 830,000 acres in sand sage, um, 858 in uh, mixed, and uh, 2.8 million in, uh, in our short grass area. Now you can notice on there that the um, um, yeah, I'm going to pick on some of the, the little pinky, uh, the pink areas on there um, are areas where uh, are proposed wind farms. Uh, on there as well are existing wind farms uh, in yellow. Um, I think uh, Jim might ver verify here, but we also, a part of this mapping operation were oil, uh, where we had oil exploration or um, oil uh, production uh, taking place, um, and I think also uh, transmission line uh, corridors as well. But you can see that what this amounts to when I said that we, we wanted to uh, pick these focal areas so that they didn't impact some of these uh, uh, already existing proposed uh, development areas or existing development areas. Uh, so you can see that um, a fair amount of those are outside of our um, focal area of Jay, boundaries. Is this Dodge and Spearville right there in the lower? Where are we in Kansas? I think I see Dodge and the wind farm of Spearville. So as and, and it, Jim, certainly if there are any questions relative to this, Jim uh, was instrumental in, in pulling this map together. And this kind of a concept is being done uh, in every in, in the other states as well.
Okay, some of the additional science team tasks, of course, were to uh, develop some habitat evaluation tools uh, and, of course, identifying additional research and data gaps that we have. One of the things that we're going to be held to uh, by the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, as we implement this plan is to be able to evaluate and monitor the impacts uh, that, our, uh, that our efforts uh, um, as we go forth in our efforts to uh, manage uh, uh, habitat uh, within those focal areas and so again um, the science team was uh, uh, charged with making sure that we have those kind of uh, evaluation tools so that we can measure this thing uh, over time and uh, and make those comparisons uh, and they be uh, consistent uh, across uh, state uh, state boundaries the uh, interstate working group uh, also had uh, some additional tasks and uh, one was to continue to develop our uh, critical habitat assessment tool uh, this is an online um, gis accessible uh, map of uh, of habitat areas in the state that are critical uh, for lesser prairie ch chickens and so we want to continue to uh, uh, develop and refine uh, that landscape uh, scale analysis tool. Uh, this tool was helpful, uh, obviously, in uh, selection of the focal areas. And it's also a tool that's available for, de for developers uh, to, to take a look at where our important prairie chicken uh, range exists and where in their planning for um, uh, siting of wind or oil development, those sorts of uh, on the ground activities uh, can use this tool uh, to avoid or minimize their impacts uh, on that uh, uh, important uh, lesser chicken um, habitat areas. Population monitoring is another one that we're going to have to continue to do and be responsible for doing by the Fish and Wildlife Service um, if, uh, uh, if our plan is accepted and we uh, and we somehow avert a listing uh, the states are going to be responsible for continuing to monitor those populations and manage those habitat types uh, or it'll uh, essentially the listing uh, process will just uh, simply circulate back around on us uh, focal area management of course uh, uh, stacked incentive programs this was an idea that we uh, needed to look at all the management uh, activities that are out there uh, land management programs uh, try to uh, take advantage of all of those and when we say stacked kind of put these incentive programs uh, on top of each other if possible to make it as inviting as we can for landowners to uh, manage their properties and get into programs that assist in uh, maximizing uh, uh, the uh, habitat quality uh, within these core areas and uh, of course in the end we want to avoid or minimize uh, development within these uh, core areas as well so we always sort of come back to this development thing because certainly oil and gas development which is on the upswing uh, in Kansas uh, is, is a real important thing in Oklahoma and Texas uh, and on some public lands in New Mexico uh, that keeps coming back around as something the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, continues to uh, keep out in front of us and and what are the states going to do in this planning process <coughs> to um, to address that uh, kind of uh, escalating developments? Okay, I'm going to breeze through this because this is information that you all are quite aware of. And and of course, if we look at the habitat, uh, uh, general habitat types that are important to uh, lesser prairie chickens, and of course, first of all, we sort of think of the uh, the breeding grounds and the lacks. Um, and uh, just kind of a description on the left side there in terms of low vegetation on ridges. Uh, uh, it is an area that is uh, leks are used to focus our um, our surveying efforts simply because it's it's where birds are quite observable, and so these still are fairly important uh, uh, locations uh, as we do um, population uh, monitoring. Uh, a note there that uh, from a habitat standpoint uh, lacking locations is probably uh, not considered a, um, a high uh, having a high limiting factor um, uh, for the lesser prairie chicken then we get into the standards and that's essentially nesting habitat uh, native grasses and shrub, uh, shrub cover uh, of course uh, our native crp fields 
uh, wherever we need denser vegetation, herbaceous cover. Um, but, but again, we start to talk about those things then that are, are really important uh, in sustaining uh, lesser prairie chicken populations, and that's uh, providing good nesting cover. Uh, brood cover goes right along with that. Um, again, something that we, uh, we harp on all the time, and this is pretty much standard for most all of our um, upland game birds, uh, nesting and uh, brood rearing habitat. Uh, fall and winter habitat, of course, winter habitat. Uh, again, uh, generally where we have good nesting and brood rearing habitat, we're providing some decent and, and pretty good uh, winter cover. Uh, of course, when people talk about food, uh, any adjoining grain fields, uh, agricultural crops uh, are gonna provide some of that um, uh, availability of, uh, of grains. And again, uh, these, these sort of things in terms of good fall and winter cover uh, are, are many times met by having good nesting and brood rearing habitat. Trees, no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> don't want trees. Uh, so anyway, and this is always, uh, uh, this certainly is a concern and something we've made some real inroads in and in, um, in, uh, in the areas of uh, Barber and Comanche and, and co counties, uh, in the Red Hills area where uh, there are, I think there are folks who probably drive through that and see all that uh, eastern red cedar and, and think, boy, what, what a scenic area. But from a prairie chicken standpoint, uh, none of that kind of stuff is very good. So we've had programs, uh, and there are programs out there, incentives for landowners to um, control the eastern red cedar. Uh, primarily through cutting initially. Uh, there's uh, some industry uh, that has uh, sprung up around that from the standpoint of uh, chipping uh, eastern red cedar and, and shipping it off for, uh, for mulching. And uh, so we've done, we've, we've made a lot of inroads and along with that then uh, encouraging and training landowners who maybe heretofore haven't really been uh, comfortable or knowledgeable in burning uh, to be able to control that uh, sort of growth. Uh, more of that uh, is taking place as well. The last couple of years has not been particularly helpful uh, from a burning standpoint just simply because of the uh, drought conditions that uh, have occurred. Fences and, fences and utility lines. Uh, there are some who feel like uh, uh, fences are a, uh, are a factor, a mortality factor uh, on, um, on lesser prairie chickens, uh, prairie chickens in general, uh, particularly where they uh, maybe exist in uh, in locations of lax. Um, we, in Kansas, we really have not, uh, we really don't feel like this is a, uh, certainly a limiting uh, factor uh, in comparison to a lot of other things that uh, take place on the, on the landscape. But there are efforts now in some places to mark fences uh, to try to minimize uh, collisions. Uh, utility lines, uh, I think in this case, yeah, there are probably some collisions that occur there, but uh, utility lines from our estimation are more of uh, an obstruction uh, on the uh, landscape um, that uh, can sometimes uh, uh, impact um, whether or not the birds really want to be uh, in close proximity to some of these um, uh, vertical structures. And this leads to human structures and activities, and of course, uh, there's avoiding uh, primary roads, buildings, oil and gas development, transmission lines. Uh, there really needs to be more research done uh, on the impacts of these um, wind towers. Uh, we certainly, um, uh, I guess we, we think and uh, have some fair information that they do uh, impact and, and the birds do avoid these areas. And so in our working with the wind industry, uh, we try to encourage uh, those, uh, those development areas to um, remain outside of the primary uh, lesser prairie chicken uh, habitats uh, so as to minimize the impacts of, uh, of those uh, tall structures. And I have to, I do have to give the wind industry a lot of credit in Kansas because where we have had these, uh, um, the large farms uh, industry has been very good in working with our agency in, uh, in placement of those uh, wind uh, generation uh, towers. And uh, so uh, wherever possible, I'd say that we are uh, indeed minimizing uh, impacts. 
And then habitat fragmentation, uh, again, uh, any of these things that occur out on the land where you begin to break up uh, the habitat types and, and you get smaller uh, zones, uh, we really need to have these uh, linkage areas uh, between our focal areas so as to have that connectivity uh, between some of our, uh, what we've identified as being uh, the best of, uh, uh, of our habitat and those areas um, in which we're going to uh, enhance uh, and improve habitat conditions. Our planning process uh, uh, starts out, uh, we did, uh, we put together an implementation team. Uh, we've had one meeting uh, with that implementation team. Well, actually, I think two meetings. And the implementation team, you can see, are made up of uh, folks who are involved in various programs that impact uh, land management um, uh, within the Lesser Prairie Chicken Range. So we want to try to uh, uh, avail ourselves of all the available tools that we have available. Uh, and we need to coordinate uh, between ourselves and how we uh, deliver those, um, those uh, programs uh, into the, our focal areas and, uh, and within uh, Lesser Chicken Range. Uh, some of the available landowner uh, and land management programs, of course, just a few up there uh, with the NRCS and FSA, of course, our wildlife habitat improvement programs. Uh, we've had some uh, lesser prairie chicken um, conservation initiative areas where even SRS, uh, uh, SRS, jeez. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> NRCS uh, has been involved in uh, identifying these almost focal areas of their own but for their conservation initiatives and Lesser Prairie Chickens has been one of those kind of things that, uh, that they have focused on. So CRP and, and other programs. We've had our own uh, Lesser Prairie Chicken initiatives. I mentioned, uh, uh, mentioned one just in terms of uh, working with uh, landowners relative to control of, uh, of cedar. Uh, partners programs, again, uh, on, the, on the ground programs with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Nature Conservancy, uh, mostly uh, trying to get involved in easement programs, conservation easements, and then uh, the Forest Service as one of the big blocks of public lands uh, in, the, uh, in the southwest part of the state that uh, uh, takes uh, management of lesser prairie chickens into consideration. Uh, that implementation team, of course, part of what they're doing is uh, trying to put all of these programs together, uh, identifying opportunities for putting these incentives together in, in packages that, uh, uh, that, that landowners uh, will uh, sort of cooperate with and grab hold of and implement on their lands. Uh, one-stop shopping is one of those things that we always talk about where landowners can go one place and, and sort of get a feel for all the programs that are uh, available. Uh, and again, in this case, uh, sort of aimed at, uh, at, ident at um, taking on this uh, lesser prairie chicken management uh, uh, planning effort. Industry involvement, uh, oil and gas, wind, transmission. Uh, of course, uh, always working with them in terms of impact uh, and trying to avoid and minimize uh, they have been uh, uh, very good, at least uh, in, in looking at voluntary offset programs where they can uh, 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 make those decisions before they actually uh, begin to develop. And uh, so again, we have to continue uh, to involve and, uh, and work with industry uh, in these, uh, particularly in these three uh, uh, venues. Landowner organizations uh, involve, involving our uh, private land organization, Farm Bureau, KLA, and others uh, to uh, make sure that we get uh, good landowner input into this planning process and then identify all those kinds of outreach opportunities that might be available to uh, make sure that uh, uh, private landowners in this state and the other states uh, are important partners uh, in trying to address this um, this issue of uh, uh, managing for managing for lesser prairie chicken uh, to uh, hopefully in the end uh, avert any uh, any listing communications as identified as something that has to continue and has to be a, a really a, a paramount part of this whole uh, operation so uh, we're developing websites uh, announcements and uh, going through these other uh, um, stakeholder groups to make sure that we keep them uh, informed of what's going on and to solicit uh, uh, input back towards uh, the efforts that we're trying to put forth. 
And lastly, uh, we do have three public meetings now scheduled, uh, 13th, 14th, and 15th of November in Nest City, Ulysses, and Greensburg. And uh, these, uh, these sites are, are essentially within uh, some of our focal areas. And so this is our first uh, uh, opening for uh, public meetings uh, to invite uh, any interested uh, parties, landowners, industry, and uh, whoever uh, to come and uh, essentially become a part of this, um, this planning process to explain to them what, uh, what's taking place and, and sort of what we all are going to have to work together on uh, if, in the end, uh, we try to uh, uh, manage these birds in such a way that we can assure uh, sustainability into the future and, uh, and therefore uh, convince the uh, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that uh, that bird uh, is in good hands uh, if we um, implement our plans and uh, and involve all of our partners in that process. And we won't know that really until uh, they make a final decision uh, a year from now. So uh, time will, uh, uh, time is not really on our side because we got some very tight deadlines uh, in getting some of this work done. Uh, the industry themselves, oil and gas, is in the process of developing some of their own conservation uh, uh, plans. Uh, they, they're called cooperative conservation um, agreements with assurances. It's something that the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, works out. Uh, we also have the transmission uh, industry, uh, sort of led by Westar to try to do the same. And then uh, the wind generation uh, industry uh, has been in the process of trying to develop a similar kind of um, uh, what's called a habitat conservation plan uh, and, and with the Fish and Wildlife Service. So they all recognize uh, the implications that come uh, with a listing uh, of, a, of a species and, um, and so we're all working, working hard to try to uh, um, meet our achieved goals. So with that, questions? Pasture burning and cedars, does it make the cedars worse, better, or indifferent? Well, actually, it makes it better because, I mean, it's not better for the cedars, but it's better for grass management and range management. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's just a good way to uh, uh, control eastern red cedars. Okay. Yeah. So you, were you saying you need more burning there? We, we need, uh, how do I want to put this, Jim? Essentially, yes, we do. With all of the with all of the uh, programs where we've removed uh, eastern red cedar, we entered into or part of that management program was that those landowners would implement a uh, a burning program. Now it's not necessarily every year uh, burning uh, like we see in the Flint Hills, but it is a periodic burn in order to keep those uh, woody vegetation out of the out of the prairie. And the thing that the thing that's pretty nice about that is that. Uh, when you have landowners and you have some very cooperative landowners in that part of the state that um, once they once they sort of once a neighbor or two or once a, a rancher or two gets started then it's sort of the neighbors start to look and, and see what he has in the way of grass production and what's occurring in it and it kind of grows there and so uh, that, that's a nice thing about uh, expanding these kinds of programs. Keith, is uh, Westar's green team involved? Well, actually, Brad, Brad Loveless is the uh, one that heads this, this effort up by Westar. They, um, they really are, um, you, really, you just have to give them a lot of, uh, a lot of positives because uh, they're in there with us on, on siting of wind farms. They're in there with us on the uh, siting of transmission. Uh, and they really are uh, very concerned about how those kinds of industries impact, uh, in this case, lesser prairie chickens, but they've been very involved in uh, efforts in the Flint Hills and avoiding the Flint Hill uh, and, um, and the Smoky Hill area as well, which is a, a pretty cool area. So, um, yeah, they're there as more or less a leader uh, in the industry and trying to pull together others uh, in the wind and, uh, and transmission uh, segment. Oil and gas uh, throughout the range are pretty well organized. 
there are independent associations and then there are larger uh, oil um, industry that are on board too to try to develop these uh, kind of planning efforts. So. So there'll be more as time goes on. We'll uh, keep you briefed on the involvement of our agency. Uh, certainly the, our agency as well as others are critical to the process and we've, and we got the people and the talent to make it happen. All right. Okay, thank you. Okay, falconry. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, you just thought you were done with me last time. Um, after a little bit further review by the Fish and Wildlife Service, they found one little glitch in the regulations that, that we passed and it dealt with banding of um, captive bred raptors. And our regulation, there was a little bit of a conflict as far as uh, band requirements. Fish and Wildlife Service required a band if, if the captive bred bird loses a band or a band is taken off for whatever reason, that a replacement band be put on. And our regulation missed that a little bit. We said a band or a microchip um, could be on, on that captive bred bird. We have since corrected that. Fish and Wildlife Service, is, this is not going to hang up any of the uh, implementation process. We're going to go forward with uh, uh, January 1st um, implementation of the new falconry uh, process in the state but uh, it will require a, a cleanup vote on one regulation in the January uh, meeting. So with that, I'll stand for any questions. What kind of motion do we need here? Nothing? We don't need to do anything? In January. Really? Mm -hmm. I like that. All right, thank you. Thank you. Lloyd. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, uh, this is the uh, permanent uh, regulations. Coming back to you after, uh, after we've looked at them, we have three that we're not planning to come back at all with this year. They are 115.4-2 uh, general provisions, 115.4-6 the firearm management units, and 115.4-11, uh, big game and wild turkey permit application. We will come back in January with additional information on 4-4. However, that's still in, um, uh, it's under review right now, and we're, uh, we're not bringing that back for review tonight. Uh, what we are uh, bringing forward it for additional discussion is 4-13 uh, deer permit descriptions and restrictions. Specifically, uh, Senate Bill 314 was passed last legislative session, and one of the provisions in that was to implement a combination antlered and antlerless deer permit uh, system and we have looked at the uh, the various options our recommendation is to come forward with a combination permit for non-residents uh, currently there's about uh, 21,000 non-resident hunters that get 
uh, whitetail either sex type of deer permits. Um, Non-residents uh, only purchase about 5,600 whitetail antlerless only permits. On the other hand, if we look at residents and we look at the whitetail either sex permits and the muzzleloader and also archery types of permits, there's about 87 or 85,726 residents. And last year, they um, all together, uh, residents purchased about 61,600 whitetail antlerless permits. They're buying them at a much higher rate and frequency uh, than the non-residents. Uh, the part of the reason is the uh, non-resident whitetail antlerless permit is a $50 permit, whereas for uh, residents and youth, it's a $15 or a $750 uh, permit. Uh, frequently, the non-resident and the non-resident leasing is considered one of our problem areas for deer population problems, where deer are, uh, bucks are taken, but few antlerless deer are taken. And we feel that by implementing a combo permit and placing uh, a two-tag permit in their hands on the lands that they are hunting, that may uh, help uh, alleviate some of the problems that are occurring on the specific areas or adjacent to the areas where the problems are occurring. We have looked at a pricing system for that. And uh, currently, the uh, non-resident deer permit is a $300 permit. Uh, we're recommending that the combo permit be in the neighborhood of about $315. That would be equivalent to the price, the addition in their permit would be uh, about the same as the price that residents pay for a whitetail antlerless permit. But it, it would put in uh, 16,000 additional whitetail antlerless permits into our system. And uh, we can see how well they're used by uh, non-residents. That's our uh, recommendation, and uh, we will bring this back for a January, bring it back again for a uh, workshop session in January and a public hearing in March. Are there any comments or questions? Anybody have any questions for Lloyd? Any questions from the public? I guess that's pretty clear then. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Chris. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, we discussed this the last time, and this is more or less a placeholder just until the Secretary of State's office gets the statutory references updated. But when the governor issued the ERO number 36, creating uh, the Department of Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism, uh, and then the trailer bill, Senate Bill 316, passed this past session, uh, it transferred those authorities officially from Commerce to our department. There are some regulations that deal with agritourism, and we just need to move them over to uh, KDWPT uh, regulations and our numbering system, and then update the statutory references. But until the Secretary of State comes out with those in January, uh, I don't really have anything. Uh, so it'll be March or April, depending on how quick we can turn those things around. But I just wanted to keep a place on the, on the commission agenda until then. Okay, does anybody have any questions for Chris on this one? All right, thanks. Thanks. A hip stamp cleanup.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the commission, this is just a cleanup and it's a result of Senate Bill 314 where we removed our exemptions for 165 through 74. And the federal requirement for hip stamps allows us to not require hip stamps for those that don't need a hunting license. And the old reg, as you can see on the next page there, read hunters less than 16 years of age or 65 and older. And so what we're proposing to do to bring this in line with the federal requirements is just refer back to the statute, um, which did remove those exemptions. And that way, if you don't need a hunting license, you still do not need a hip stamp. But if you need a uh, senior pass or whatever, you will need a hip stamp. Correct. Okay. Hip stamps cost 50 cents and $2.50 of a Coles fee. It's a $2.50 fee, yeah. Anybody have any questions on this? Any question from the public? All right. Thanks. Thank you. Well, now, this moved along pretty well. Uh, we have reached the end of our agenda. Uh, we need to, I guess we can go ahead and, and recess. Uh, we'll reconvene here at 7 o'clock sharp. Thank you very much for everybody's time. Won't be served until 5.30. Okay.